This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles for just $2.99 a month. Get a free 30-day trial by clicking the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. If you look up on a clear evening, you'll be able to make out a point of light with a distinct red glow. One of the five brightest objects in the night sky, the distant planet has been known by many names. The Egyptians called it Her Desha, or the Red One. To the ancient Babylonians, it was Nergal, the god of death. But you know it by its Roman name, Mars. Created from the same primordial gas and dust that gave birth to our world, Mars has long been regarded as Earth's sister. As recently as the 19th century, many believed an advanced civilization lived there, one we could deduce from their network of canals. Even in the 1960s, scientists still held out hope that simple vegetation might exist on the red planet. Alas, it was not to be. Today, Mars is regarded as a dead planet, one on which, if life exists, it's only as microbes in pockets of water deep below the topsoil. Yet this outcome wasn't inevitable. Billions of years ago, Mars had all the ingredients to become a flourishing, Earth-like place. That it didn't is one of our solar system's greatest tragedies. Around 228 million kilometers from our sun lies a world of legend. Often known as the Red Planet, Mars has fascinated humans for millennia. The earliest recorded observations come from Egypt around 2000 BC, but it's hard not to imagine Neolithic farmers watching it with wonder long before writing existed. That's because Mars is one of the brightest objects in the night sky, behind only the Moon, Venus, and Jupiter. In fact, the red planet has fascinated humans for so long that you already have likely heard all sorts of associations, from Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles to people singing, the chances of anything coming from Mars are a million to one, he said. But what actually is Mars? If you were to hitch a ride there on Elon Musk's Starship, what would you see? The first thing you'd notice is that Mars is both incredibly similar to and completely unlike Earth. In the similar categories, you have the Martian Day, or Sol. Each Sol lasts for 24.6 hours, not all that different from a day on Earth. After the Martian sunset, you can likewise see a moon, in this case Phobos, the only one of Mars's two moons that's easily identifiable from the surface. Just like on Earth, the Martian year is divided into distinct seasons, with a spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Were you to stand in the right place at the right time, even the temperature might feel not dissimilar. At certain points in the year, the Martian surface can reach a balmy 20 degrees Celsius. But that's where the similarities end. Everything else is as alien as can be. Because of Mars's crazy thin atmosphere, heat escapes easily. So easily that while it might be 20 Celsius for your feet, it would be around 0 Celsius for your head. Not that you'd feel it, because the air is mostly CO2, nitrogen, and argon, meaning that you'd have to be in a spacesuit. Years, too, pass differently. While a Martian Sol is similar to an Earth day, a Martian year lasts 669.6 Sols, almost double a year on Earth. The seasons aren't even different lengths, with spring in the Northern Hemisphere lasting 53 Sols longer than autumn. Of course, though, the most notable difference is the gravity. Since Mars is about half the size of Earth, gravity is only 37% of what it is here. While you wouldn't quite go bouncing around like in those videos Stanley Kubrick faked to the moon landing, moving would be pretty easy. Good job too, because for a tourist on Mars, there's a hell of a lot to see. There's Valles Marineris, a canyon so long it stretches further than the distance separating Los Angeles from Honolulu, and so deep the Grand Canyon's lowest point would reach less than a third of the way down. There's Halas Panitia, an impact crater so deep you could place Mount Everest at the bottom and it still wouldn't reach the rim. Most impressive of all, there's Olympus Mons. The biggest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, is to geological features what your mama is to average-sized ladies. A staggering 25 kilometers high, it dwarfs our world's greatest mountains. Cool as these places are, though, the coolest place may lie at Mars's poles. At both the extreme north and south are polar ice caps that shrink and grow with the seasons. While most of the ice visible through telescopes is CO2, each cap contains about 1.6 million cubic kilometers of frozen water. And that's just on the surface. In 2020, it was confirmed that a small cluster of subglacial lakes lie below the southern pole. That means Mars may be one of the only places in our solar system with liquid water, even if that water is likely too salty to support life. So that's Mars in a nutshell, a spectacular, dead, dust-covered planet that nonetheless would make a great vacation spot. Yet dead may not have always been the best word for describing Mars. It's time to take a look into the past and at a Mars teeming with all the ingredients for life.
The Martian story begins 4.5 billion years ago, with a whole lot of dust and rocks at last coalescing into our solar system's fourth planet. Although it was born around the same time as Earth, Mars had less material to draw on, meaning it only ever grew to be roughly half the size. In fact, Mars is so small that it's dwarfed by both Earth and Venus. Only tiny Mercury, the runt of the planetary litter, is smaller. Yet being the solar system's premier, short hours didn't derail Mars's development, at least not at first. Beginning 4.1 billion years ago, the Nokian era marked Mars's brief stint as our solar system's Eden. While Earth was still a burning catastrophe of acid and noxious gases, Mars had settled into something approaching stability. The air temperature was around 25 degrees Celsius, with an Earth-like pressure and a magnetic field that shielded the planet from the sun's rays. On the surface, there was not just liquid water, but actual oceans, vast expanses of H2O, the stuff of life covering most of the northern hemisphere. Elsewhere, rivers flowed, rain fell, lakes, well, they sort of just sat there, being all lakey. But I mean, you get the idea. Today, we can still see the evidence of this ancient water on the Martian surface in channels and depressions formed eons ago. Which raises a question. What the hell happened? The answer was a one-two punch of catastrophe. The first came in the form of something known as the Late Heavy Bombardment, or LHB. A miserable period in our solar system's history, the LHB saw an apocalyptic number of asteroids hurtled toward the inner planets. Chunks of rock smashed into the terrestrial worlds in a bombardment that would make what happened to Dresden in World War II look positively restrained. An average of 53 tons of rock hit every square meter of Mars, smashing apart its developing ecosystem and destroying a third of the planet's surface. Basically, this was the reset switch on any building box of life that may have already formed. A planet-wide sterilization event. Or so the theory goes. Over the last few years, more scientists have started to question if the late heavy bombardment ever really happened. What we can say for certain is that Mars entered its next age, the Hesperian, having survived whatever the LHB may have thrown at it. Water still existed, but no longer on the surface. At some point in the Hesperian, Mars turned into a frozen world. This deep freeze wasn't itself fatal. The planet was geologically active, and magma flows sometimes heated the glaciers enough to release rivers of meltwater across the surface. But what caused this ice age may have been deadly. At some point, Mars's core seems to have cooled, to have stopped working. As it died, so did the planet's magnetic field. As the magnetic field faltered, the atmosphere was stripped away by harmful particles from the sun. The volcanoes, too, stopped erupting. Olympus Mons last blew its top 25 million years ago. At last, with its dead core and thin atmosphere, Mars dried up. The water evaporated, and the planet died. The great tragedy of all this is that early Mars could have easily supported life. Many experts today fervently believe the red planet's ancient seas teemed with microbes. Interestingly, some even think those microbes might still be around. In 1976, NASA's Viking mission picked up what appeared to be signs on Mars of microbial respiration. While it was eventually decided this was a process mimicking life rather than life itself, at least a few of those who worked on Viking, including the lead LR experimenter Gilbert Levin, maintained the signal was exactly what it appeared to be, evidence of microbial life. In other words, as unlikely as it is, Mars could still be a living world. While all this crazy stuff was happening on Mars, across the Gulf of Space, Earth was undergoing its own bizarre adventure. From an uninhabitable catastrophe of a planet, our world had become downright welcoming. As Mars froze over, then dried up, complicated chemical reactions on Earth were giving way to initially simple and then increasingly complex forms of life. For millions of years, strange sea creatures thrived before crawling onto land and evolving into equally weird terrestrial beasts. As our planet spanned through the void, dinosaurs appeared and got blown up, mammals ran riot and gave rise to apes, and eventually, some of those apes got it together to evolve consciousness. When these newly conscious apes looked at the sky, they couldn't help but notice a bright dot with a distinctive reddish hue. And so began humanity's long history with our sister planet Mars. Since Mars has always been visible, we can't give the exact start date to this story. While we can pinpoint the moment Neptune or Pluto entered humanity's consciousness, Mars has just always been there, remote, fascinating. 
We know the ancient Chinese and the Maya both tracked its movements, and that Australia's ancient Aboriginal cultures invented elaborate stories about it. The Romans, meanwhile, named it after their god of war, a name we still use today. But while Mars has always been with us, it's not until the early modern period that we actually began to understand it. Even then, it would take centuries for us to learn the truth. The first person to see Mars with more than the naked eye was Galileo Galilei. In 1609, Galilei pointed a primitive telescope at the red planet, unknowingly kick-starting a whole new era in astronomy. Not being all that interested in Mars, though, Galileo didn't record many observations, instead leaving it to others to do all of the real work. So, well, buckle up, because you're about to get hit with a deluge of long-dead science dudes. The first surviving shout-out goes to a Dutch astronomer called Christian Huygens. The guy who discovered Saturn's moon Titan, Huygens was already a big deal in astronomy when he turned to Mars, and his reputation didn't disappoint. Huygens was the first guy to realize the Martian Sol was nearly the same length as an Earth day, the first to note the southern polar ice cap, and the first to make a recognizable sketch of Mars. He was also, with his posthumous book Cosmotheoros, the first to seriously speculate there might be life on Earth's sibling. After Huygens, the next major figure is William Herschel, a man who later channeled everyone's inner butter by discovering a planet and naming it Uranus. For this story, though, Herschel stands out for being the first person to figure out that Mars's polar caps were ice, and recording that they melted during the summer. However, he also mistook the planet's dark patches for oceans, giving yet more credence to the idea that Mars could be a living place. But it was in the 19th century that Mars fever really took off. Over the century, Mars would be accurately mapped for the first time. Accurate, in this context meaning accurate for dudes who only have telescopes. They also found out that it had two moons named Deimos and Phobos, discovered by American Asaph Hall. Remarkably, Hall had been searching in vain for Martian moons for some time, only to give up on his quest on August 10, 1877. His wife told him to quit moping around and give it another shot, so Hall dutifully returned to his telescope on August 12, only to immediately spot Deimos. And how's this for a weird bonus fact? The guy Hall asked to name the two moons, Englishman Henry Madden, was the great uncle of the girl who'd later named Pluto. How about that? But while finding Deimos and Phobos was the great Martian discovery of 1877, it was bound to be overshadowed by a far more sensational one. That same summer, a linguistic slip-up was going to convince the English-speaking public that Mars wasn't just home to microbes or vegetation, but minds immeasurably superior to ours. Now, we'll continue our exploration in just a second, but first, a quick word from today's video sponsor, CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. CuriosityStream is available on many platforms and web apps, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TV, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, uh, pretty much everywhere. And it's constantly being updated with awesome, timely content. Right now, for instance, they've got a new popular documentary series called The Top Science Stories of 2020 obviously features a lot about COVID, but also dives into CRISPR, the Mars rover, fossilized DNA, and several other exciting news items that you missed last year. Now, if you're enjoying today's video about Mars, you should absolutely check out their documentary, Mars Perseverance Countdown to Impact. It's all about NASA's latest expedition to the Red Planet, courtesy of the Mars Perseverance rover. It's definitely one of the coolest things on Curiosity Stream right now, worth checking out. Right now, you can go to curiositystream.com forward slash geographics for unlimited access the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series for just $2.99 a month or just $19.99 for the whole year. And right now, special deal for you guys, you can get a 30-day free trial, just use the code GEOGRAPHICS at checkout, and let's go back to Mars. Eighteen seventy seven was an important year in human history. It was the year of the US Compromise of eighteen seventy seven that effectively ended Reconstruction, the year Tchaikovsky premiered Swan Lake, and the year the Russo Turkish War reshaped the Balkans. It's also the year planetary science basically turned into an ancient aliens meme. By the latter half of the nineteenth century, many scientists were already sure Mars's dark patches were seas, and that the seasonal changes in the surface were due to vegetation spreading and retreating. But it would be a mistranslation that turned this harmless speculation into utter insanity. That year, as Asaph Hall was spotting Martian moons, astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli was making his own discovery, a network of channels crisscrossing the planet's surface. Being from Italy, Schiaparelli christened them canali, an Italian word implying only natural channels of water. Unfortunately, when it came time to translate it into English, canali was incorrectly rendered as canals, implying artificial construction. Off the back of this one slip-up, the world went 
bonkers. At the time, the papers were full of news about the recently built Suez Canal and the proposed one in Panama, so everyone was primed to believe massive canals were the clearest sign of civilization. There were slews of articles with outlets as reputable as the New York Times reporting breathlessly on Martian canal construction projects. In America, uh, William Pickering would declare giant mirrors should be built to flash signals at the planet in hope of a response. In France, a rich widow offering a 100,000 franc prize to anyone who communicated with aliens moved quickly to exclude Mars, lest claiming the prize become too easy. Meanwhile, over in England, Mars fever would eventually inspire the writer H.G. Wells to pen his invasion classic, The War of the Worlds. But perhaps the man most beautifully influenced by Schiaparelli's Canali was Percival Lau. Both incredibly rich and delightfully eccentric, Lau became convinced studying Martian life was his calling, so much so that he built a special observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, to carry out his work. There he spent decades sending out breathless reports about canal construction sprees on Mars, even as other better astronomers definitively proved Schiaparelli's Canali were optical illusions caused by the era's limited telescope technology. Yet Lau's absurd work wouldn't be in vain. While studying Mars' non-existent canals, Lau used his spare time to run calculations on other planets. When it came to Neptune, he accidentally messed up his figures, becoming convinced that its orbit was being affected by a hidden ninth planet, even specifying which part of the sky it should be visible in. Several years after Lau's death, the self-taught astronomer Clyde Tombaugh was at the Flagstaff Observatory, monitoring the same patch of sky when he spotted a faint pinprick of light. That pinprick would turn out to be Pluto. And that's how an optical illusion caused by a telescope turned to Mars led to the discovery of everyone's favorite dwarf planet. Just after midnight on July the 15th, 1965, a faint signal was detected on Earth, one that had crossed unimaginable kilometers of empty space. Though it was artificial, the signal wasn't from a bunch of Martians bragging about their newest canal. Instead, it had come from a human device, a probe assembled on Earth and sent hurtling towards our planetary neighbor. Known as Mariner 4, it was the first probe to ever pass Mars. And now it was beaming back humanity's first detailed images of the Martian surface. Although Sputnik 1 had kicked off the space race only eight years earlier, the 1960s had been marked by an expansion of interplanetary missions. In some cases, like Mariner 1, which blew up right after takeoff, those explosions were literal. But more often than not, it was what the missions accomplished that rocked the world. Just three years before Mariner 4's historic flight, Mariner 2 had become the first ever probe to report back from another world when it flew by Venus. And now it was Mars' turn. The photos Mariner 4 beamed back that summer were unbelievably grainy by modern standards, and they took eons to arrive. Just one photo took around 10 hours to download. Once visible, they were almost disappointing. The Martian surface Mariner stapped was a dead, cratered one, as inert and lifeless as the moon. Although this was just a fluke, Mariner photographed about 1% of the Martian surface and missed all the exciting signs of ancient geologic activity purely by luck, it was enough for the papers to declare Mars fever over. But the scientists who actually worked on Mariner knew different. They knew Earth's sibling was only just beginning to give up her secrets. To cover every single mission that subsequently went to Mars would take forever and involve way too many sentences ending with, but then sadly it malfunctioned or crashed, so we'll just do the highlights here. But they are some pretty good highlights. In late 1971, both the USA and USSR scored important firsts in Martian history. That November, Mariner 9 became the first probe to orbit Mars from where it photographed over 85% of the surface, forever dispelling the image of a boring world conjured by its predecessor. More impressively, December of 1971 saw the Soviets place the first lander on Mars. Unfortunately, it malfunctioned after a mere 110 seconds, but it was first. Somewhat more useful were NASA's 1976 Viking missions. Both Viking 1 and Viking 2 successfully deposited landers on the surface, one of which continued to function all the way until the 1980s. Although there was a big gap between missions after that, NASA didn't forget about Mars. In 1997, their Mars Global Surveyor arrived in orbit above the Red Planet from where it mapped the entire Martian surface. By now, though, there was a new generation of explorers on the way, the Martian rovers. From today's perspective, it's hard to recall just what a crazy, wonderful achievement, spirit, and opportunity were. The first Martian rover, 1997's Sojourner, had traveled only 100 meters across the surface before dying. Spirit and opportunity would not just break that record, 
but that set new ones that wouldn't be broken for years. Launched in 2003, both rovers had been built in such a hurry that the software team were still beaming out patches to them as they made their way through space. Yet despite being thrown together at warp speed, and despite being intended to only last 90 sols, the two rovers lived for years. Spirit lasted until 2010 and covered 70 times the amount of terrain Sojourner did, racking up 7 kilometers before it died. Opportunity, on the other hand, lived until summer 2018, 50 times longer than planned. In that time, it traveled an incredible 45 kilometers, providing us with breathtaking images of the Martian landscape as it did so. Of course, they were just the earliest success stories. Curiosity landed in 2012, and at the time of recording, it's still going strong. Yet, while the achievements of NASA's rovers in the 2000 and 2010s were impressive, it's what's still to come that could truly reshape our understanding of Mars. As you sit here, probably watching this video on your phone, there is currently a next-generation rover on Mars performing the coolest experiments in science history. Perseverance successfully touched down in Jezero Crater on the 18th of February 2021. As we're recording this, it's still sitting there, testing its systems and making sure it's ready for its main mission. But by the time you watch this video, or possibly soon after, it should have already started doing some record-breaking things. Chief among these is launching its onboard helicopter, Ingenuity. Presuming it works, Ingenuity will be the first helicopter flight ever undertaken on another world. Although Ingenuity is mostly a proof of concept for future missions, Perseverance is set to do other amazing stuff, including drilling and collecting samples with the goal of finding evidence of ancient microbial life on Mars. Assuming you're watching this when we put it out, rather than, say, stumbling across it in 2028, that means confirmation that alien life Life once existed in our solar system may only be a year or so away. Of course, that's only if Mars ever really did evolve microbial life separate to Earth. But even if it didn't, there's still some exceptional stuff in the red planet's future, from human visitation to colonization. Let's start small, with placing the first man or woman on the Martian surface. Although it seems like science fiction, the idea of humans on Mars has been kicking around since at least 1947, when Nazi war criminal slash NASA hero Werner von Braun proposed Das Mars Project. Featuring 10 ships constructed in space and a crew of 70 on a 520-day mission, Braun's project was insanely ambitious. Although he estimated it would be feasible by 1980, that milestone came and went without NASA even pretending to be interested in trying. Instead, the agency now believes it will send humans to Mars by the 2030s. This is more than just talk. NASA is actively planning to place the first woman on the moon by 2024 as a dry run for a Mars mission. The hope is that a four-member surface habitat can be trialed there along with a habitable mobility platform that could allow wide exploration of the Martian surface. Yet NASA may not win this race. For years now, billionaire SpaceX founder Elon Musk has been vocal about getting to Mars. At the time of recording, SpaceX is testing and refining its Starship rocket with the goal of putting humans on the red planet by 2026. We should probably note, though, that Musk is infamous for missing his deadline. So anything actually happening in 2026 is an outside bet at best. Still, if nothing else, it shows the confidence the private space sector has in Mars as an achievable destination. But SpaceX doesn't just want to land there. Musk's vision is a Mars colonization project, one beginning around 2050 and involving up to a million people, history's first Martians. It sounds fanciful, but it could be the red planet's future. If that's the case, then the short-term future of Mars may well be more exciting than anything but its most distant past. After lying dead for billions of years, Mars may be about to embark on a new chapter, one where we discover both signs of ancient microbes and once again make Earth's sister home to life. And that's what's so fascinating about being alive right now. We might be witnessing the birth of a whole new future for our planetary neighbor, one which would render this entire video nothing but the prelude to the real story. If that's the case, then we can't wait to read it. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you again to Curiosity Stream for being such a great sponsor of this channel. And definitely please do check out that Perseverance documentary that we mentioned earlier. And as always, thank you for watching.